So, uh, good afternoon everyone and thank you very much for joining us for this first Art on Our Mind talk of 2019 and the first talk of the Art on Our Mind series at uh, Wits University. The Art on Our Mind series was uh, created in 2017 as a response to the many fascinating and incredible women of color artists and creatives that we have in South Africa, um, but in response to the lagging discourses that there are uh, with regards to their work. And so um, what we want to do is create an archive of uh, material that collects and responds to women of color South African artists and creatives. So our first uh, area of focus is uh, visual artists, but we're also responding to other creatives in the fields more largely. And what we do is we have a team of volunteers and uh, this wonderful team of volunteers spends two to three months researching our chosen uh, woman of color creative and that team then uh, generates questions for the creative dialogue that we have, uh, this public creative dialogue. And uh, during this dialogue, we ask questions uh, that deal with the artist's life, her work, her creative methodologies, uh, the challenges she has, but also her inspirations. Uh, one of the things that we noticed uh, very early on and that I noticed very early on as a artist was that many of the articles on visual artists in particular was very biographical fo focused in that, um, you know, if somebody was writing on Tracy Rose, they spend more time talking about Tracy Rose's life and that Tracy Rose was swearing rather than the fact that Tracy Rose had such uh, engaged bodies of work. And so what we spend a lot of time doing is speaking about the artist's work and about her ideas. Uh, that doesn't mean we ignore the challenges and about her life, uh, but we do spend a lot of time engaging with the artist's work. We use this opportunity of the creative dialogue to, as a primary research, to generate primary research. The video is then put online, we transcribe the video. Um, we put the transcription, the video, the audio, because in some countries video is very heavy uh, data. So we put the audio and the transcription online. And then we take all of the material that we found and we put it on the archive, artonourmind.org, uh, and we make that available freely on uh, our, the blog. And it doesn't matter whether you're um, a school child in Mitchell's Plain, and I met, mentioned Mitchell's Plain because I've gotten over the years a lot of uh, children, high school children from Mitchell's Plain writing to me to say to me, hi, can you send us, to send, send us uh, information about your artwork? So I don't know what art teachers in Mitchell's Plain are doing, but if there's any art teacher or child watching this video from Mitchell's Plain, I'd like to give a shout out to them. Um, I'm sorry that I think that I'm famous, but really, I just, I really love that I get email uh, requests from them. And so, um, wh and, or whether you're an established researcher anywhere in the world, that we try to make ease of access through the, through the Art on Our Mind platform. Um, and our team also uh, generates articles, what we have going on right now, uh, whether it's accredited journal articles or whether it's Wikipedia entries. Our uh, Art on Our Mind team at the moment has a Wikipedia workshop uh, that happens every second week and we are generating Wikipedia entries on the visual artists as well that uh, we are researching. So if any of you are interested in that ongoing initiative, please contact our team and get involved with that as well. Um, so that's a little bit about the Art on Our Mind uh, initiative. We also run the yearly AFEMS uh, 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 African Feminist uh, Conference 
This year we already have about 120 papers, so we're super excited about that. The theme is uh, theorizing from the epicenters of our agency based on the Molare Ogundupe Leslie idea. And so we're looking really, really looking forward to that. And Lebo um, Khane is our first artist that we are featuring for the year. And um, I'm super excited about this. She's one of our Art on Our Mind volunteers. <laughs> um, but she doesn't know what the questions are. We kept her out of the questions. So she hasn't generated any questions on, her, on herself, which would have been slightly odd, I think. So the rest of the team did that. And uh, before we start, I do want to give a, a, a round of thanks. Uh, firstly, to uh, Reshma. Um, Chiba for um, making the point of order available on really short notice. Um, it's really lovely to have a space like this to be able to do this kind of work and Reshma is always so accommodating at such short notice. We put this exhibition up within one day um, and Lebo made the works available as well. Um, and Reshma is always so accommodating on such short notice for the students as well. And so, you know, we can never take, take for granted that, that people can be accommodating and so welcoming because um, uh, these things are, are not so easy across the world. Um, the Department of Visual Arts here at uh, Wits University, which is now a new <coughs> home for art on our mind. We're super excited about that. The School of Arts here at Wits University. The National Research Foundation, which is our chief uh, sponsor for the project. This is our third year of funding and without them, uh, Art on Our Mind simply wouldn't exist. Uh, our new Art on Our Mind team uh, that gives off their time so generously to make this possible. Godfrey Mushlangu, who helped set up the exhibition yesterday at short notice. And of course, every single one of the artists uh, who generate their time to come and sit with us and give off their knowledge. So thank you guys very much for that. So Lebo, uh, I've known you for almost, a, what is it, like a decade now? Yeah. But we're going to do this quite formally. Okay. Where were you born? Um, I was born in Tatlohong, um, which is on the east end of Johannesburg. Okay. And uh, what did your parents do for a living? Um, I was raised by my mother, um, so I'll refer to her for a lot of your questions. Um, she worked as a factory worker um, mm -hmm. since she was in her early 20s, um, up until she passed away. Okay. What was it like being raised in Katlaho? I mean, I don't think I take those years for granted at all. Um, I think it formed a huge part of my personality, the different, um, different exposures, um, being able to access um, suburban areas through school, um, but then going back home to the township and sort of needing to merge those two worlds which are completely apart. Um, being the only kid that could um, read English for, for the kids in your street, you know, if they'd get a, a <laughs> if they'd get like a a storybook or a fairy tale, that make me read it. And I think that 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 comes across, I think, in my interest around um, interrogating these stories that um, that we grew up reading, such as fairy tales. Um, so the later work or the, my earlier work speaks to to that part of my childhood, the fact that I had to also read these stories out to um, the kids that I grew up with. So one of the questions that the team had for you was attending these multiracial schools um, in Johannesburg. How has that impacted on your identity as a young black South African woman? I think that more than anything, it gave me different perspectives. Um, and that's something that I appreciate till this day. I'm not saying that it wasn't, it didn't come with its own um, conflict, internal conflict um, about uh, you know, wanting to to be a part of um, or be like the white girl, um, and I guess the, the the earlier work also speaks to that. It, it, it speaks to me having the realization that I spent a large part of my childhood wanting to um, articulate myself or um, just have a similar identity to these white girls that I grew up with um, or that I had access to. 
and then bring that into the township and then have, have a conflict with being in that space um, and having my friends or my family um, and people that I care deeply about in that space. So, so it came with a lot of its own identity um, challenges um, that I think I worked, or I'm still working through. <laughs> um, but yeah. How did you encounter art and what kinds of creativities did you grow up with? <coughs> I suppose my first encounters um, to art were through poetry. Um, I met a few poets um, while I was in, in Gatlehong, or while I was growing up. Um, there was an art center that was close by. Um, there would be people coming to like recite poems. And I got into that culture. Um, so I'd, I'd write poems and I'd, do, I'd recite with them. And I suppose late, uh, when I was in high school, um, I carried that through. Um, they, they were like poet, um, poet groups that, I'd, um, that I was a part of. And I'd, I'd come to the market theater with friends. Um, and I suppose I was also introduced to performance through high school. Um, so I, I thought I'd eventually go into like script writing or poetry or something <laughs> along that line. The plan was never to, to go in the visual art side of it. Which brings us to the next question. Where did your passion for photography start? And what inspired your decision to enroll at the market photo? I feel like all of it really just happened by itself. Um, that what I'm doing now really chose me because I had actually applied at, at WITS with the intention. So after high school, um, I'd applied at WITS with the intention to do journalism. Um, which now I think I wanted to do more like creative writing, not necessarily journalism. I just didn't have the language, <laughs> the language for it. Um, so I just thought that if you want to be a writer, um, you have to be a journalist. So, so I applied at WITS um, and they rejected my application. Um, and and yeah, I remember- I can't imagine you as a journalist. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so after they rejected the application, I'd, 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 a few months before, um, while I was still in, in high school, while preparing for one of my English comprehension exams, I had um, one of my, my teachers had given me an old paper, um, which one of the comprehension tests was around the life and death of um, photojournalist Kevin Carter. So that was basically my introduction to the term photojournalism. Um, and, and I suppose I was like, oh, I've never heard of that. That sounds cool. Um, <laughs> and, and then when Vince had rejected my application, I sort of you know, considered it. Um, and then I spoke to my mother about it. And luckily, she, one of her colleagues had a, had a niece that had studied at the market photo workshop. Um, and she had studied um, photojournalism. So she was like, um, so she, she sort of had the conversation with her colleagues. and. They then suggested the market photo workshop. I wasn't too sold on the idea um, because because I sort of had my own plan. I wanted to go to vets. I wanted to have like a formal education, um, you know. <laughs> so and that was rejection one. <laughs> that was the first rejection. <laughs> um, and so so that happened, and then and then so she convinced me to come and check out the space. Um, and then I, I, wasn't, I wasn't really for it, but then I came and then I sort of fell in love with the market photo workshop. Um, and then, then, I then I started my training there. And the plan was that I'd be there for the year and go and apply again for, <laughs> for journalism. Um, but I stayed on for about two, three years and then I didn't even major in, in photojournalism. I then did the advanced course, which is where I met you. Um, and, and I mean, the rest is history, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And then you did, uh, and then you applied for vets mm -hmm. to, do, <laughs> to do fine art. Yeah. And then they rejected you again. Yeah. <laughs> and then you did a BTEC at UJ. Can you tell us about a little bit about that, that study experience? Um, so I went to UJ in 2014. Um, and I suppose I went to, 
I suppose that for me, studying fine arts was not really something that, that was part of the plan again. Um, so, so I'd worked, so when I com after completing my studies at the market photo workshop, I then worked um, a bit in your commercial spaces, um, in media, and, and then I realized that I didn't really want to, want to be that sort of photographer. Um, so I worked for a bit, I worked um, on set, um, and I suppose that that influence comes in into the later works. And, and then I was like, no, I think, you know, based on also how things were going, um, just the exposure that the previous works had gotten, um, and then I decided to study because I thought <coughs> that if I'm gonna enter into that, that space, I also needed time to sort of step away from going into um, becoming like a professional artist without having that space um, from the photo workshop and then straight into that. Um, so I, I suppose that, that those three, four years afforded me that space to sort of be sure that it's, um, that it's something that I wanted to do because I don't think that there was any um, point when I decided that I wanted to be an artist. So it allowed me that space to, to be sure that I wanted to do this or if I wanted to pursue journalism maybe. <laughs> <laughs> or writing or something. Um, so so it, it gave me that, that sort of time to be sure that it's something that I wanted to do long term. Have you finally given up this journalism thing? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it was ever about journalism per se. I think it was, it was about wanting to write. I think I've always wanted to tell stories. Okay. Um, and it seemed, it really seemed to me like the only way to tell stories was through journalism. So I think over these last few years also um, in allowing the process to just take place, um, I've realized that I am telling stories. Um, it's just that I've found many different ways to tell stories and it could, it could at some point still include writing, um, but it, it doesn't need to just include or be about writing. So, at a certain point in your advanced level, I think it was, you moved away from documentary photography and began using masquerading as a strategy within your photography with your Black to Fairy Tales series. Can you speak a little bit about your relationship with the medium and what you have learned in the process of turning the lens on yourself in your photography work? and how you navigate in the line between self-insertion and posing? And would you say there's a dialogue between this, the idea of self-insertion versus posing? Um, I think that also going back to what I, what I mentioned was the fact that when I, my introduction to, to the arts was very much through poetry. And then when I was in high school, um, then I took part in like um, in plays, um, and we, we we got quite exposed to like um, theatre productions. Um, so we're, we're performing quite a bit. I think since I was about thirteen um, till I finished high school. So so I suppose that 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 what I do at this point allows me to integrate those different worlds. The fact that I that I was exposed to performance and that, um, that it's something I also grew quite passionate about and, and then my exposure to photography. So I think from the earlier work without really, um, really thinking about how um, what I do now allows me to merge those different worlds and, or those different interests. Um, but Black to Fairy Tales became the start of, of that journey where I think my work will always have a, an element of performance. Um, which I think to a large degree, I don't know, I don't know about the term self-insertion or posing, because I think to a large degree, I, the work for me is very much like diary writing. Um, so there is, there is a, a part of me that I feel, um, that I feel that I explore through this process, um, and photography again just allows me that. Um, and I think there's something that you said about a month ago that there's, um, that there's, that a camera allows me to mediate reality. And, and that's something that I've been thinking about, about the fact that for me, the process of, um, of being in front of the camera um, and having my camera on the tripod and that relationship or that, 
the distance, but also the, the close proximity with that. It is, to a large degree, me playing out a reality, but also a fantasy, because, um, because I think that a lot of my work really explores those elements of, um, of play, um, like playing out a certain fantasy, um, playing out an idea that I have of myself. And I think that my photography also speaks to that. It speaks to the fact that I think um, photography is very much about performance, that people perform quite a bit for the camera. Um, it's just that I'm, I suppose I'm, I'm very conscious and I almost um, extend it slightly further by creating sets and creating props, um, but people perform for a camera anyways. I don't know if and I you, answered you. <laughs> yeah. Because you don't, as much as you like performance, you don't like performing live. No. Because I forced you once to do a live performance mm -hmm. and you hated it, mm -hmm. right? So, so for you it's important that, that you have control over the whole performance and that it's the camera lens that's mediating that. Definitely. I think that to a large degree I'm someone who's very much aware of like self-preservation. Like I I love my distance. I, I, I try and negotiate how far I get to people. Um, and I suppose that my work or how I go about producing my work um, also speaks to that, that I I decide who to get close to and the sort of um, how close to get and how, allow, how close I allow someone else to get to me. Um, and even though my work has a lot to do with um, just my own, so it's mostly personal projects, so it's like things that I'm, I'm interrogating about myself um, or working through, um, which is why I say that I think that a lot of the work that I um, that I do has a lot to do with um, with therapy for for, for me. Um, so I think that that relationship and that distance um, and feeling safe in you know in how I, how much I allow people in is is important. I mean I think especially if you work on personal projects that you you almost need to safeguard how close people can get um, because I mean also even with um, projects like the one about my mother, it's very much a personal project. Mm -hmm. So I need to create a situation where I, where I'm safe even in how I, um, how I allow people in into that story mm -hmm. and in that journey with me. Mm -hmm. And speak a little bit about that project in a minute. Um, but I was wondering, because uh, one of my favorite works uh, is this work. Uh, and we can't get there because we're having a little bit of a problem with the media player. Uh, but it's this work where you dressed as a sunflower, and it's based on this the a story you narrated to us when you showed it of when you were in a play in school, and it you wanted to be Snow White, and you weren't allowed to be Snow White in school, and you had to be the sunflower. <laughs> and it was, I was so disturbed to write <laughs> by the story. And you, you have this whole Black to Fairy Tales uh, series. And so I wanted to know this uh, about this dialogue in, the, in your work between fairy tale and memory and rememory and how you reconstruct <coughs> uh, <coughs> these, char these characters when you reimagine yourself and you restage yourself in these various characters. So how, how do you re-envision yourself as these characters? Because now you get to be author and you get to be whatever characters you <coughs> re imagine yourself to be. Um, these are all your stories. So, so how do you go about reauthoring these stories? Um, okay, so the story um, that you're referring to, um, <coughs> like fairy tales. Um, so, so the the inspiration I think behind that project had a lot to do with um, my memories of primary school and the fact that um, every year we'd have to play out a certain fairy tale. Um, and we'd obviously have to audition for it. Um, and obviously every year me and my friends would audition to be the main character, um, such as Snow White, for example. And um, 
and we'd never get the parts. Um, for example, that year I, I, I was a sunflower um, instead of Snow White, <laughs> and obviously I had no lines. Um, <laughs> Um, so I, I suppose that in, when I started the project, it's, it started from, from that point because Snow White was one of my favorite fairy tales um, growing up. Um, and, but so it, so it sort of stuck with me. I don't remember the other plays and what the roles that I got to play for a lot of the other plays. But Snow White stuck with me because I really prepared for that audition. <laughs> um, and I had no lines, I was just a sunflower. Um, so I suppose in, in then reimagining, um, and I think that also the, the themes that I've, been, that I've been working with, even right now, um, I'm trying to write for, for my masters, is the, the relationship between memory and fantasy, um, and, how, and how close um, those two are to each other. The fact that even when I, um, when I, when I went back to that memory, that I also reimagined that memory, um, so it, it had a lot of elements that were fantastical. So in, in me then rewriting something that is fantastical, like a fairy tale, um, there were many things that I changed. So I did get to be Snow White in as much as I got to be a sunflower. <laughs> um, but I then needed to think about what, I, what my ideas around being Snow White is. Um, so it had a lot to do with me having to deconstruct these um, these fairy tales. Um, so reading them and re um, reading what the Walt Disney version of them, but also reading the original um, books, um, and then trying to link them now with a lot of African folklore. So I mean, so that was quite a journey on its own because I had no exposure whatsoever to African folklore. Mm. Um, so I then also had to start thinking about how do I then access these and how do I then relate these two, these different stories or these two different worlds, which do have similarities. Um, so in authoring that, I suppose I was constantly trying to find um, a space or create a story that allows for these two, two worlds to, or two worlds to merge. In 2010, was it your mom passed away? Um, you were doing your intermediate level at that time in market photo? I was just about to start the advanced yeah. photography. And so we met that, that when you were doing your advanced level. And I was very surprised. We were sitting and it was a sunny day outside in the Johannesburg Art Gallery. And, like, and then you were, like, told me we were just having this arbitrary conversation and you told me that your mom had passed away and you seemed so composed when you were saying this and I was like struggling to like attach this narrative uh, of you being now the head of this household with, and you had this younger sister um, and, you, and you also had a grand that was taking care of you but I was just struggling to attach this narrative to you. Um, and I wonder if you can maybe speak about this period in your life because it's something that so many other South Africans can, can relate to and what it meant to go through such an adjustment at such a young age. Um, I mean, I think 20, 2010, a lot, a lot had happened, I think, for, for us as a family. Um, a few years, a few months prior to my mother passing away, um, my aunt had passed away um, and we hadn't had a death in the family. Like, forever um, so it became quite a, a hectic year I think for not just for myself but for the entire family um, so even when my grandmother sort of moved in with us um, to take care of myself and my sister um, she was also a mess because she'd lost two daughters so there was so there was also no room for me to be a mess um, because as much as she was there to take care of me I felt like there was to a large degree um, a part of me that felt that I also had to take care of her um, so I suppose that when when I started to um, work on on the part that I did a few years later about my mother it's only then when I felt I had the space to to actually um, be a mess <laughs> Um, or to, to mourn her or to acknowledge what had happened or my, my feelings around that. Um, so it, it happened, I think, a, 
uh, two weeks before I was supposed to start my advanced photography um, course. Um, so there was, there was also that um, a decision that I needed to make whether I was going to study um, or go work. Um, and my family was like, you know, go study anyway, it's just one more year. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful that I was given that, that space to do that um, and that support to do that. Um, but it definitely wasn't, wasn't an easy, easy period. Um, also having to sort of navigate between being a sister and being a mother um, to, my, to my younger sister. Um, yeah, but I think, I think over the years we've sort of found a balance. Um, when when she, she needs to um, read me as sister and when she needs to read me as mother when I'm saying no. <laughs> um, so I mean it's over the years I think we've definitely found um, found a way to to sort of navigate that that relationship. Um, yeah. Okay. And so in Khalifa in Laka um, you use double exposures and I've always found that interesting because you know when we grew up with double exposures they were supposed to be discarded right um, because it's, it's meant to be the error but so it's like double exposures right we're supposed to mean like the, it, it's bad photography yeah. but here in the day of like digital photography you're you're using that as to kind of recreate a ghosting and to like reconnect with your mom of almost like literally stepping into her shoes of embodying her what did it mean and particularly right now in light of what you you've you've said about that period in your life what did it mean to kind of literally bring her back in this way um i suppose that for me th that project particularly um I've always said that it's the most honest um, work that I've ever made because I feel it happened without me really thinking about it um, as a project or thinking about it as like um, I was literally just looking at, a, at our photo albums, at her photo albums particularly, and and then just you know realizing that a lot of the clothes that she was wearing um, were still in her wardrobe. Um, this is. I think two years after she passed away, but these are her clothes from when she was in her late twenties and thirties, um, and and I suppose that that project sort of happened by itself in that way because I'd seen these photos over and over again, and they'd never triggered um, much in me, or they'd never I'd never made that that connection, and and even when I'd even when I'd um, gone into her bedroom or her wardrobe. Um, I'd never, you know, made a uh, come to the realization that these clothes are like 20, 30 years old, um, and that these clothes had also outlived her. Um, and as much as the photos had outlived her, um, so so in then me thinking about um, looking for the locations where she'd been photographed um, and restaging a lot of these photos. Um, and then going with my younger sister on that journey, who then um, was behind the camera and taking the photo of me. Um, so she'd have the original photo in her hand and tell me, no, move your arm like this, <laughs> um, smile like this, talk like this. So she would, she would direct me. Um, and then she, she would take the photo and sometimes would go with my grandmother. My grandmother would help us find um, a lot of the locations where the photos had been taken. Um, so I think in that sense that the project um, more than anything allowed for for us to have a conversation because we hadn't we hadn't really had a conversation about um, my mother passing away um, or my, my grandmother losing a daughter or us losing a mother um, and through this project I suppose it allowed for us to have that conversation with each other and as much as it allowed for for us to or for me to have or try to create a, a conversation with my mother, but it also allowed for me to um, have this conversation with with my grandmother and with my my sister. Um, so, 
so it, it almost allowed for the three of us to to have a space or to create a space where we we celebrate her but we also mourn her um, at the same time um, and I suppose that later on in the in the project I then um, through conversations um, with one of my mentor um, um, who suggested that perhaps to consider merging the two photos because initially I thought that there'd be two um, two photos that sit next to each other um, and then she you know she suggested that you know the possibility of actually merging them as one photo because that spoke closer to um, what I was trying to say through this um, pro this project or this process um, and I suppose that that, that spoke truer to, to this journey um, of me also wanting to create a space or a time where we could still um, be together. So. Mm. I also wonder what it means to try to understand one's parent as a young person. Um, I'm thinking of two images, for instance, um, and I think in my mind they've uh, become a composite. And forgive me for uh, screwing up the um, the pronunciation here. Uh, is it Setwanso le? Yeah, number two and Katu PC Yaka Pinky two. <laughs> yeah. can, can you try to get to one of those? Um, and it feels like you're looking down on your mother as a young person from your age and you're trying to see her and the way that she loved you and interacted with you and your sister and, and there's such a, like, a remarkable loving gesture about that. It reminds me of like two things. Um, there's an image uh, of that Bell Hooks talks about of a father. In she never saw this uh, this image of him uh, when he was a young man and unmarried and carefree, and um, he'd given this picture of himself uh, to one of her sisters, and the sister had a better relationship with him than uh, than she had, and it's a picture of him when he's a young man with a white T-shirt. And um, she looks at this image of her father and she sees him for the young man he was, this carefree man that he was before he was married. And, you know, he's playing pool with a friend and he looks really happy. Uh, you know, like before he was married, before he had children, before he had the cares of, of the world, before he was, you know, father and husband and burdened. And, and she sees him with all, without all of these familiar responsibilities, right? And these relationalities. Um, and she says, you know, she's looking at the fact that sometimes, like when we become bonded to people, uh, we also become blinded to them. And um, she's trying to see him for the independent person he was. And then the, um, the other thing I'm also reminded about is that once, uh, before I moved to Johannesburg, I, I found myself in a very dangerous situation. I'd, I'd come to, to Johannesburg and I wasn't very familiar with it and I ended up in this hotel and, you know, um, here in the city center and I wasn't very familiar with Joburg at the time. And I called on this artist because 15 minutes after I arrived in this hotel, uh, every 15 minutes, the guys started knocking at the door asking me to open up. And then I realized, oh my God, people people thought I was a prostitute. And and they were insisting that I open up the door. And so I called this artist, one of the few people I knew in Johannesburg, and I said, please help me out. And so she sent over her husband, and her husband was the musician Gito Baloy. And he came over, like within like 15 minutes, and he, you know, he drove me to their house. And he was quite busy, she was, my, this artist was quite busy. And, um, I was like shaking and Tito just spent the evening talking to me very nicely and stuff and then calming me down. And the next morning my, uh, the artist had gone off quite early to work and Tito was there and he gave me breakfast and he, I just watched him, you know, again I was shaking the, the next morning because I just kept wondering what, had, what, what, what would have happened if this artist hadn't you 
know, answer the phone that evening or whatever. And I watched him playing lovingly with his two daughters. And they were like really, really young, like under four or something. And then you know, it was such a, you know, so sweet to watch a father playing with their two young daughters, with his two young daughters. And a year later, when I was, you know, I got the news that Jito had been violently killed in a hijacking. And that image just came to my mind. And wh where I was, and residency elsewhere in the world, I just, you know, I just sobbed because it's just like this, these two girls would just never ever know about, you know, th this father that loved them so much, you know. Th people will tell them how much their dad loved them, but they'd never grow up with that image of how much their dad loved them. And that, and that image of you looking down on your mom and this image here of, of how she looks at you, you know, with so much love, oh my God. So, like, you know, when I, what I'm asking is what it means for a black child, particularly in the context of the history of South Africa. You know, when we talk so casually about apartheid and what it did to the black family structures, what it means to examine family bonds and structures in this way. What, is it, what does it mean to examine black love like this? Um, so I think as I mentioned earlier that I, that I, was, I was raised by my mother alone. Um, and that's always been something that was quite significant to not feel the gap um, of the parent that's missing, or that's not in the picture. Um, and I suppose that for me, that's something I'll always be, be grateful for, the fact that she, she filled the gap, or I never felt like the other parent or the other part wasn't there, because I was just showered with love. Um, and, and I suppose that even years later, when, when I sort of reunited with my father, um, and to reject that from my side was because I'd experienced so much love um, that I didn't want um, to be in a situation that couldn't equate to that for my parent. Um, and I suppose that for me, this photo is also, it's that because I'd experienced so much love that I can't um, accept anything um, below um, that version of love. And putting your image side by side with your mom, did it ever cross your mind, do I measure up? I mean, definitely. I mean, it, I think it's, uh, it's something that I, I'm constantly faced with, um, even right now. Um, I was having a conversation yesterday, last night, with my sister. And then she was telling me about something that I said years back. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to make such a horrible mother. <laughs> You know, I'm like, I, like I burst a bubble, you know, <laughs> about life. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, I, I always have those moments where I'm like, I wonder what kind of mother um, I'm being to her. Um, because it's, it's, always such a, it's, it's always such a negotiation, really, like to, to be who I am, who is like a natural skeptic. Um, you know, and who she was, which was like an optimist, like about everything, <laughs> you know. Um, so there's always, there's always that, um, I'm always trying to navigate that, especially with my, with my sister. So I always have that question of, do I, um, besides am I, am I half the woman that she, she was, um, but the mother that she was, um, because I feel like I want my sister to, to experience that, even if it's through me. Um, so it's, I don't know. <laughs> I ask because, I mean, we all, we're always thinking that, right? I mean, all of us. So what does the album mean, mean to you as a curated, fictive project? The album? Mm. Her photo album? The family album. Um, so I mean, I think when I, when I worked on, on the project, I then started to, to actually realize how curated um, 
our family photo albums are. Um, like how, like with her photo albums, um, a photo would be accompanied by like a, a cutout from my magazine, like um, the words like on a lovely day, on a sunny day, you know. <laughs> um, or um, I was a mess today, like things like that, like very quirky. Um, and I mean, I mean, I'd seen the, those photo albums like a thousand times before, um, but when I um, when I looked at them, I think in like 20, 2012, just before the project happened, you know, I just realized how quirky my mother was. Um, but also just how everything was, that photo album was so well curated. Um, how like the photo that followed, um, there was like some sort of sequence. Um, and I mean, I tried to recreate it and I just couldn't. Um, would like to recreate something similar that speaks back to it, and I just couldn't. Um, it just didn't have the same feel. Um, so in terms of the photo album, I think, I think it, it is like a it is like a fairy tale. It is like a storybook, um, and that's why I feel like the different projects, to some degree, really relate to each other. I feel like um, from from Black to Fairy Tales to Gile Falak and the bodies of work that are followed. Um, that a lot of them have had to do with actually the, the fact that I wanted to be a writer. Um, and, and I suppose that with where my practice is going, um, a large part of it will be returning to, to book form. Um, because I feel like that's sort of what I've been, what I've been working with um, this whole time with the fairy tales and with these photo albums. So there are several other works in which your body becomes transparent through long exposure times. Um, so for instance, in a work like um, Untitled 22, uh, we see this image that is both blackface, uh, which should denote a kind of masked figure, but this is at the same time fleeting. So for me, this creates all kinds of tensions. When a black person purposefully uses blackface to show how they have been blackened by society, how they have been asked to be a coon by white supremacist society. They have been rendered, they have been rendered themselves hyper visible in the ways that whiteness knows and stereotypes and consumes blackness. But then you have made it transparent and ghostly then it becomes uncertain. So from being hyper-visible, you've made it transparent. So then it becomes, by the ghosting and the transparency, it becomes a thing to be dreaded. So what I wanted to know from, from the hyper-visible coon that the master wants, you've made it into a ghost a thing to be dreaded by the master. So what does the ghosting mean as a visual strategy to you? Because you use it in various ways in your body of work. Um, I suppose that initially it had a lot to do with the concept of memory. Um, and, but particularly with Black to Fairy Tales, it had a lot to do with the fact that I didn't in me auditioning constantly for those roles, there was never a point as a kid who understood um, why we were never getting those roles, right? We still went here after you auditioning for a role similar to Snow White. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't, you really didn't understand no, why you didn't get the Snow no. White role. <laughs> I mean, and I suppose that I think to a, to a large degree it had a lot to do with the fact that even when there were those tensions between me being at school in a multiracial school and being at home um, with my with my black friends, that there was never that I never really understood what what the tensions were. I never really understood what my difficulty was in the fact that I didn't fit in either space. Um, so and then when I eventually worked on this this project and I started to reflect on um, on my years. Um, my childhood years um, and reflecting on them through this process of black to fairy tales, um, that it's only then where um, I got to understand um, 
the reason that we never got those roles, for example. So I think it's only then where, um, where I, I, like I was confronted um, with my blackness. I know it seems very bizarre, <laughs> Um, but I, I do think that to a large degree, I felt like, you know, in, even though there was difficulty belonging in both worlds, but there was a sense that I, you know, that I belonged more in that world, um, or that I wanted to belong in that world. Um, so in, even in this idea of ghosting, in as much as it, um, it had a lot to do with memory and how, um, and how memory is not tangible, um, how it's, it's fragile and how it changes every day. Um, but it also had a lot to do with the fact that I, I was coming to this realization um, of or confronting or being confronted with with my blackness, and it, it was happening through through me thinking about these memories um, of the fairy tales. Um, so in in using blackface, um, I think it had a lot to do with that realization. But also with my with my difficulty with it, mm. you know, because I think that in as much as you in as much as you recognize that it had a lot to do with race, but you also are confronted with the fact that did I was I actually a good actress as well, right? So it's also those those two questions. Um, so yeah. Okay. Can you tell us how you came up with the idea, uh, uh, rather the move uh, to the sculptural qualities of the cardboard in the Pied Piper series, um, where you then enact the character of your grandfather as he relocates to Johannesburg, and relatedly the concept of Isita Takaselo, and why it's such an important cultural concept to you? but also what the personal significance is. Um, so, so a few months after, after my mother passed away, so my grandmother came to live with us, um, live with myself and my younger sister. And I'd never really taken note of the fact that our surnames were spelled differently. So we had like four spelling variations of our surname. Um, and, and I suppose then, the, this project, or this project on this side of the wall, started there. Um, it started with me thinking about um, the surname and what the correct surname was, um, and then, and then I started to ask my grandmother questions. Um, and again, this project happened without me. I mean, it was a bit more um, conceptualized, but when I started um, having the conversations with my grandmother on the surname. Um, and why surnames were different, um, and then her relating them to the different locations where they'd, they'd lived, and the different, um, because they'd, they'd moved to a lot of different farms, um, and how in certain areas where they'd lived, their surname was most likely to be spelled a certain way. So when it would get recorded there, it would be spelled a certain way versus in a different location. Um, so that the, the spelling of the surname one had to do with the fact that they, they weren't writing their own surname um, down because they, they couldn't write or read. Um, but it also, had a, it also had a lot to do with location. Um, so so that's, that's sort of how I then started the project of then um, trying to find the different farms that my family had lived on. Um, so over the 12 months that I worked on the project, I then tried to visit the different farms um, and I don't see you as what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see you traipsing around on farms. You don't know me. <laughs> um, so, so I then, through the help of my grandmother, tried to um, locate the different farms because it's also so some some of the places weren't farms per se, but it's where other family members had moved to um, when they eventually. Um, got kicked off the, 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 the farm that they lived on the longest in Free State. Mm -hmm. so, so I then um, tried to find the rest of my, locate, my family in different places um, through my grandmother. It's, it's also family members that I hadn't met before. So, um, so she became quite um, important in, um, 
in narrating the stories, but also in connecting me to them because I'd never met them before. But I wanted to, you know, obviously interview them um, or do my research for this project through them. And and at the same time as all of this was happening, I, I was working at, at ETV um, on set, um, and and I was quite fascinated with um, set design. Um, so, so I suppose that, that, that sort of influenced the, um, me creating the sets um, for, for the project. So, so while I was, so, so these things were sort of happening simultaneously. So while I was, um, over the weekends, I'd go in and find my family in the different places, and then during the week, um, I'd be on set. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it, it sort of, um, it, it influenced to a large degree the, the process that I used for, for this project. And then in Kesale Teng, you took that and you made it into a, an animated video. And um, again, because of the problems with the uh, media player, <coughs> it is available for you to watch there on Levo's laptop afterwards. Um, and, and, and that gave you another dimension, right? So you were able to now take that into uh, a, a, an a animated video. Mm -hmm. um, but what was it like connecting with other members of your family? Because for me, like when my mom passed away in, in 2017, it was like an umbilical cord being cut actually for me. I, I, I actually, for me it was actually disconnecting with a lot of family, extended family. Um, but for you, your grandma is still alive. She's in her 80s. Can you tell us a little bit about your grandma? <laughs> because I think it's nice to know a little bit about her. Um, and uh, but then also going on from there, um, would your staging of your work, Moshla uh, Komedi Watora, that was staged at uh, Pretoria Art Museum. It speaks to the power of women as storytellers, as keepers of tradition and memory, and much of it draws attention to the centrality of narrativization in our lives, um, that we are all living, walking, constructed narratives, that we are never outside of narratives, whether they are visual, oral, or, 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 or written down. Um, and that you've taken the memories and the oral narratives and that you've just translated them into a, a lot of different ways. Um, but th you, there's a real focus on, on that kind of the matrilineal uh, heritage that, 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 uh, that you've also kind of focused on within your family. Um, so what does it mean to have that kind of connection now that you're kind of focusing on? Um. But tell us about grandma. <laughs> oh, what do I say? Um, her name, for instance, <laughs> as a well, her name is Maria, so mm -hmm. it's Maria Khan. Um, say hello, everyone. <laughs> Maria Khan. Come on, um, audience. <laughs> hello, Maria Khan. Hello, Maria Khan. <laughs> it's interactive. <laughs> um, so I think that she was quite she was quite uncomfortable firstly when I started um, the project when she realized that I was actually making a project because yeah. she's quite shy and then at some point it moved from us just having conversation to me saying that can I record her uh -huh. and then initially she was like okay and then she just went on and on and she spoke and then I think she started getting annoyed because after listening to like one recording, so, so I'd ask her questions. Um, so I started to read about um, like tracing your roots and genealogy. And, and then I, I was like using certain um, samples um, on like sort of interview questions on like what you ask when you uh, are trying to trace your roots um, to sort of connect the dots. And, and then I think at some point she got really like irritated with me, continuously asking um, or interviewing her. Um, but I think at that point I'd had um, so much to work from 
that when I started interviewing other family members, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of gotten enough information from her to work, uh, to work from. Um, and I think especially in regards to the surname, because when the project started with the surname, and Khanye means light, um, so, and also as you mentioned, um, I don't know, are you able to go to the installation? Um, when you mention Mothokomedi, which is the, the installation, um, which is sort of my first installation um, that I did last year at the Pretoria Art Museum. And Mothokomedi Watora means lighthouse keeper. Um, and it basically, it, it speaks to the fact that to a large degree I was looking for, you know, for the source of light. Or, um, but actually in, in, having, in having traveled, um, and done these interviews with my family members, um, with me looking for for the lighthouse keeper or like stories around the light. Um, I then came to the realization that a lot of the the stories that my family members were telling me about were around my grandfather, um, because he was the first one to move to the city um, before even apartheid ended, so before they even kicked off the farm. So he was like, no, he doesn't want to work on the farm, he's going to go look for work in the city. So so the project sort of centered around him because of that. So everyone had all of these stories about him because he was the first one to move to the city. Um, and when when they eventually got kicked off the farm and they didn't have like jobs or their own homes, they all lived in, in his house. Um, so everyone sort of has all of these stories about him. So he became quite central in the project. So with Mahlokomedi, which is this, um, this body of work, um, it sort of allowed me to go back to the fact that, um, that the project started to a large degree around my grandmother with these stories, um, and that she was actually at the core um, of, of the family history, even though with me having done this research, this research she was actually raised um, from the narrative. Um, so this project had a lot to do with um, me actually going back to the core of, um, of, the, of the story and she, she was that because I think to a large degree she'd also, because my, with my family it's, 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 it's mainly women, so I was raised by women, um, and she played a large part of being like the, the dad. Um, so it, it, it also had a lot to do with me going back to, to actually that, um, or acknowledging um, that. So for a lot of your earlier works at the market photo uh, that I remember, some of your earliest ones that I saw, you were looking at the facades of the township houses in Katlafong. Um, and with your Black to Fairy Tales, it, they all had a very strong use of colour. And a lot of your works, your more recent works, we see that it's actually much more monochromatic and grayscale. Um, which actually does a lot for the use of the illusion of documentary in a way. Um, so are, are you purposely using those, that kind of grayscale to create the illusion of documentary? Um, to, I think to some degree. I think there's always the, like for example with um, Gile Falaka where there's there's me who's performing in front of the, the cardboard cutouts which are black and white mm -hmm. and um, I'm almost like the colour figure. Um, so I think it's always been about trying to create or merge two worlds or two times. Um, so to merge like the past with the present and to almost create a continuous conversation through um, through that. Um, so the use of, of black and white and of colour is very much a um, conscious decision, I think, for the different different projects. Okay. So there are a few concepts that come up quite consistently in your work, like childhood, journey, narrativization, uh, constructs, fictions of all kinds. Which ones do you like most and which ones do you detest the most? What would you like to tell art writers all over the world when they come up with attributes to your work, such as nostalgia or self-exploration, to either go deeper or to tell them to just please stop? <laughs> to please stop. <laughs> Which ones? Um, so you said it was narrativization. 
it was childhood. Um, you tell us which ones. <laughs> <laughs> which um, ones do you detest the most when they apply to your work? Nothing comes to mind right now. I know there there've been things that I've read where I'm just like that's nothing close to what the work is about. Um, and but nothing nothing comes to mind to mind right now. But I think for me the themes that I'm definitely dealing with, um, like I mentioned earlier, is definitely on memory and fantasy, um, and the relationship between those two. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question and then we're just going to do a fun section after that. So you've won a lot of awards which include the IPA Moving Image of the Year Award, uh, the Market Photo Tierney Fellowship, the Jury Prize at the Bamako in Encounters Biennale of African Photography, the Contemporary African Prize in Basel, uh, the Sasol New Signatures Award. And so at quite a young age, you've already had some major successes in terms of exhibitions across the world and recognitions for your talent. But what are, what are some of the struggles you face in your career as a female artist of color? And how do you think they affect the way in which you navigate within the arts industry? And how do you overcome or manage some of these issues? And what advice would you give to other women artists of color looking to carve a space for themselves in the art world, bearing in mind the kind of audience that you're speaking to right now, which include young student artists, curators, creatives who are looking to enter the industry? Um, I think that for me, what was um, what I think was crucial right from the beginning, um, I think also because, like I mentioned earlier, that I had never, there was never a point when I decided to be an artist, um, was to constantly step back um, and reflect on whether this was um, what I wanted to do. Um, because it, it comes with a lot of its own challenges. Um, and especially, I think, as an artist who's creating work that's personal work, um, and constantly trying to um, create a distance or like a safe distance between your work and yourself, your um, your your audience and yourself. Um, so I think that you need to sort of find um, take care of your mental health <laughs> um, because I think that that I think that, that there were definitely moments where. I recognize that mentally, like I'd taken so much strain. Um, also, because I don't know if if people make the 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 distinction between your work and you. I think that it's something that you need to create, um, so that it's it's not that you need to decide if you are your work, you know, or if your work stands by itself. Um, and so these are things that I that I sort of started to think about because I wanted to make that separation to not feel like if I'm coming into a space um, that I need to I need to be you know um, be le panchan because that's what's expected. But I can come in a space and just be in a space um, because the work should stand for itself and it's not it's not about. And also because I didn't expect the, the sort of celebrity culture that's with the arts. Um, so that was also a shock for me. Um, so I, I sort of needed to make those decisions about how do I navigate that and separate myself from that sort of culture. Um, so I don't know if I've given you advice. <laughs> but that's sort of the, the sort of thinking that I'm um, thinking around my practice and around my relationship with with what I do that keeps it healthy for me at this point. What do you enjoy most about being an artist? Traveling for free. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's got its perks like traveling for free. <laughs> um, getting a lot of really amazing books for free. <laughs> so I clearly love freebies. <laughs> Um, but also I think the access that it gives you to really amazing women um, 
I mean, I've gone to conferences where I've really met amazing women, and I think that for me, that's something that you know that I, I don't take for granted. Um, so. Okay, so this is a segment that is we entitled the Marcel Proust Bernard Bernard Peebles James Lipton Art on Our Mind Questionnaire. It's a very very quick response time. So quick, ne? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what do you look for in a good photograph? Here we go, quick. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Okay, I'll skip that one. What delights you instantaneously? Uh, bolognese. <laughs> bolognese? What's your pet? I just thought about food. <laughs> <laughs> What's your pet peeve? Pet peeve? What's that? Something you hate. Uh, can I say I'm not a fan of documentary photography? <laughs> You're not a fan of documentary photography? Yeah. Did you guys I don't know that? if I should. <laughs> What's your least favorite color? Least favorite color? The people at the back need to hear. Uh, okay, let's say yellow for now. Uh, do you have a favorite book or writer, or if you were a literary character, what who would you be? Mm. Oh gosh, I'm that person. <laughs> I knew you would be. Uh, okay, let's say Shalin Khan. <laughs> I'm not even a literary character. Sure. Mm. Who is your favorite artist? That was the response. <laughs> and, and the next uh, one, who is your heroine? Shalim Khan. <laughs> <laughs> if you could wish any artwork into your life, which one would you want to have? Ooh. A lot of video work, so I'd need a cinema room in my house. So I need a house. <laughs> <laughs> Which artist, artwork, or art movement do you despise? Do I despise? I don't like Nigerian movies. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of song gets you going? Uh, any Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston? Yeah. Okay. What is your favorite word? Um. Um. <laughs> what is your least favorite word? Um. <laughs> what turns you on? Um. Red wine. <laughs> what turns you off? Uh, beer. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you laugh? Anything. <laughs> What's your best virtue? Uh, laughter. What is your idea of misery? Um, not being able to see the good. What sound or noise do you love? Um, I think the train. The train? Yeah, I miss staying in Bramfontein because of the train in the morning. What sound or noise do you hate? I think loud box. Like I have a dog and it barks really loud. Okay. What is your favorite swear word? I don't know. Do people have that? You don't have a favorite swear word. Favorite swear word? Yeah. Uh, I suppose fuck. <laughs> <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I wish I could dance. Like professionally? Dance Just professionally. Dance. You can't okay, dance? Well, okay, professionally. <laughs> what profession would you not like to do? Mm. Nothing. 
is the stuff. I just don't know. Okay. I mean, I don't. I don't like um, like um, heavy machinery. Um, so I mean, I major in sculpture, but I'm very terrified of like heavy machinery. So I think any situation where you know I have to like cut stuff and <laughs> like jigsaws and. You know. How would you like to die? Mm. I think after a really good night out. <laughs> so. yeah. Okay, if heaven exists, what would you like God to say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Did you learn to love? Did you learn to love? So for the next 15 minutes, uh, we'll open it up to the audience and you can ask Debo anything that's on your mind. <laughs> um, okay, so just looking at your body of work, I was quite drawn to um, the images where you are superimposed, you know, the ones with you and your mother. And you're just like, stop me if I'm reaching, okay? <laughs> So I just started thinking about um, this, uh, Derrida's idea of ontology, right? And how, and how ghosts or memories, how we interact with them in, in the present. Um, and I was thinking, because you've already said your family is one of many women, is there a possibility for you to articulate or, you know, to think around the absence of, a, of men in the family or father figures. And I'm saying this because looking at you as a black woman artist and looking at how you super, you're superimposed onto this, um, uh, uh, the images of your mother, not that it's necessarily easy to relate, but I do think that it's easier to you know, embody those experiences because you yourself are a black woman. What would an attempt to do the same with a male figure look like? Um, I suppose that the, the other part, because Gila Falak has a two-part project, and uh, the other part, which are the images here, um, focus on, on my grandfather. Um, and, and I mean, the, also the reality was that my grandfather had passed away before I was born, so I don't have any, any memory of him, any relationship with him at all. Um, and in me then reenacting all of these stories that I was told by my family members about him, um, I then sort of take on his persona, I play, um, I play him out. Um, and also similar to um, the poems around my mother was the fact that also it relied a lot on photography um, because I only, I only had photos of him and in the photos he was always wearing a suit and a hat. And so, that, so when I ran at him, I, then I put on the, the suit similar to the one that he was wearing and a hat. And I think for me that's the closest that I'll come to um, to to playing out or to to speaking to the to the males in the family because he became central in the project because of him moving to the city, um, but there isn't really any acknowledgement from my side of the the fathers I think um, that we all have because they've not been present. Um, and I suppose it speaks to, and it's, it's a story similar to a lot of um, other families. So I, I don't think that I would try and reenact. And I mean, me and Charlene have had this conversation since she's my supervisor for my MA, um, about as I'm continuing with, um, with these conversations for my MA, um, about acknowledging the elephant in the room, about my father, um, but also that I, I actually can refuse to, to acknowledge that, that part of me, um, and I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. I have a question that's more about um, adulting hacks. 
in terms of preserving um, your mental mental health, obviously, um, your okayness, um, while being like this person that's making these great things for yourself and to communicate ideas to the world. Um, have you found, how, what has helped you gauge where you are? How do you keep in touch with yourself and how do you look at yourself um, and, and kind of stay close to what you need as a person to wake up the next day or live your best life and, and that being separate to what the artist needs to create a work? Um, I suppose for me, the, the, I can separate myself from, from my work. Um, I mean, I, I, I would say in most cases that I'd, I, I'd emphasize that I, I make art. I, I don't want to say I'm an artist, I make art so that I can create that separation for myself. And I actually practice a lot of self-care weird things. <laughs> um, such as? Uh, such as the chemical peel I did. <laughs> <laughs> Two days. Um, but but I, I think that taking care of yourself, whatever that means for you, um, you know, you, you need to decide on what it means for you. Um, I sort of have my own weird rituals. <laughs> um, but for me, the separation between the fact that I make art, um, and I don't want to say that I'm an artist, but I, I make art, um, especially because it's, 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 it's mostly personal work um, that I need to almost create a distance for myself. I don't know, maybe I didn't answer you. <laughs> um, when working with family archives, I find that there's always an overwhelming amount of pictures to work through. So how do you pick like a particular amount to work with? and? which pictures are gonna fall into that amount? I mean, I think it's, it's difficult. There's like, because also when I, over the 12 months that I worked on, particularly this project, um, when I was visiting the family members, I then um, re-photographed a lot of their photos and the photo albums, um, or scanned them. Um, and I had so much material um, to work through that even now it's like, it's images that I'm, I have no idea about how I'm going to resolve them or how, um, even in me, um, still wanting to explore the concept of Isitagazem um, through Miami um, and the surname to go, because I feel like I, I sort of abandoned that, um, the initial questions that I had around um, the family. But when I, when I collected these photos, I had no idea what to do with them. Right? But I, so I, what I did was I sketched, um, <clears throat> so, so, I, so I then would listen, so when I'd come back home, I'd listen to the voice recordings over and over again. Um, and then, and then I, I chose um, six scenes which were being re repeated by different family members, like that had said the same thing. Um, for example, um, one of them, which is the wheelbarrow one, um, different family members had said that they had a memory of my grandfather about how, because he used to drink a lot, that one day he got so drunk they brought him home um, on a wheelbarrow, right, because he couldn't walk. Um, and this is like a story that was repeated by many different family members in different um, places that I visited. So it became, uh, in a way, like a collective memory because um, this is like something that happened like years ago, but that people recalled. So it clearly became quite significant maybe because it was funny. Um, so also those stories helped me um, choose the sort of images that I worked with, um, the, the archival images that I worked with. Um, but also the, so I then would sketch out the stories that I was being told. So I'd create like a drawing of the stories that I was being told as I imagine it. Um, and then, so that would help me decide on the images that I needed in order to create the set. Um, but I mean, I think every project is different in terms of how to um, choose the images to work with for, from the archive. Because they are overwhelming. If, if you're lucky enough to have access to an overwhelming amount. Um, yeah. Okay, um, you spoke about uh, Instagram, I'm sorry, so it's called Tinana Taylor, right? 
how do we work through these very almost African ideas, especially in the academy? How do we work through almost not exposing, but how do they become concrete and how do they become how do they become weighty in the in the sphere of the academy? <coughs> because lots of times they're almost just a, a very tiny genre, but they don't actually become filtered through the academy. How do how how do you, for instance, speak to that? I mean, I've just started my MA. Um, no way. <laughs> um, I sort of just have have I, ideas of. Um, I mean, also it's going to be reliant quite a bit um, with. Um, or, like with oral history um, so a lot of it will be stories that I'm collecting so that that will be carried so I'm going to have to find a way or um, a resolution on how to deal with um, oral stories and then um, bring them into um, academia somehow with the help of my amazing supervisor <laughs> um, but I mean I still I still don't don't know it as to how I'm going to navigate that um, at this point it's it's very much about going back into um, a lot of the, the stories that I've, that I've collected because I did quite a lot of um, voice recordings um, that I want to go back into so that even when I continue with it, I sort of have um, an idea of what I want to go back into if I'm going back to visit um, family members, um, the sort of points that I want to touch back on. So we get asked a lot here about why we do what we do and the other question that they ask is how do we navigate our work around like something that's already been done, you know? Um, and yeah, I just want to ask you that like why, why do you do, why this particular series, you know, for what, for who and how do you navigate your work around things that are already out there that touch on similar themes that you're working with? I think there'll always be things that touch on similar themes that you're working with. Um, but it's still your own story. You know, it's like... Like, the reason that I started the project was to sort of find the correct surname. You know, so in that sense, it's my own story. Um, and in terms of the approach, I think you'll, you'll, you'll find your own approach as you're going on this honest journey. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I don't have the answer. Um, but I think, I don't know, I, I don't know. I think that everyone has a different visual language, anyways. Is this chapter of your life closed? And if not, what's the next phase? Or how do you imagine the next? phase of this? Uh, I don't know if the, the chapter is, is closed per se. Um, I think like I mentioned earlier that for me, my process of working will always, to a large degree, make me think of myself as a kid writing a diary. Um, so, um, so I think it will always have like elements that are autobiographical. Um, so with the next uh, with the next few um, projects or what I'll be working on over the next few months, it sort of brings in the different um, different bodies of work together. Um, because I I want to work on my first pop up book, um, which would sort of have elements of like these cardboard cutouts and similar to the installation, but it would just be in book form. Um, so I, I don't I don't think that the the, that my themes would be different. It would just constantly be new techniques. Um, yeah. Okay, we have to bring the session to a close. Um, once again, a few more thanks to Akona for assistance uh, with lending us equipment. Uh, to our, we have a little intern this time. Uh, Seshlorana Kikana who helped us with the installation. It's wonderful to have an intern. <laughs> uh, to Mia van der Merwe, oh, no, sorry, it's now Mia Lowe, <laughs> <laughs> who's come all the way from Nelspreet and she's our art on our mind uh, videographer and editor. It's always such a pleasure to work with Mia. So thanks, Mia. 
and of course to having an audience. So thank you guys for coming in the middle of the day. Uh, it's wonderful to see you, so thank you so much for coming. There are drinks and snacks, please help yourself and you can continue the conversation with Level and of course to the artist herself for making this uh, works available on such short notice and for just <laughs> having this creative dialogue with us. So thank you all very much, thanks. <laughs>